Thank you all for joining us uh, early on a Sunday morning when I'm told they're playing tennis somewhere in the world. Um, we are really lucky this morning to have with us two mayors who are really at the leading edge of the movement to try to improve the delivery of public education, to improve public education um, in this country. They face, I think, some of the same problems and challenges, but also are coping with very different sorts of school districts with very different tools at their disposals to try to affect change. And I'm hoping we'll um, have a real conversation today about how they're approaching the problems. Um, we're going to talk for about half an hour or so, and then I'm going to open it up uh, to you guys for qu questions. Um, first, as introductions, immediately to my right, um, uh, Mayor Antonio Villaragosa of Los Angeles. Uh, I understand you actually dropped out of high school briefly in your junior year um, before returning to school, eventually becoming a lawyer. Uh, and Does a it pursue an acting career? No. <laughs> Fashion. <laughs> Fashion. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, and I went to law school. Now I'll that. Oh, but uh, and then I working as a graduate from law school. Um, uh, an important legal distinction. Um, uh, <laughs> Truth in advertising. And you became a labor organizer, worked among others for the, for the, teachers, for the teachers Union in Los Angeles before you were elected to the uh, State Assembly uh, in 1994 um, and was elected by his peers as speaker in 1998 uh, uh, and ran uh, for mayor of San Francisco, became mayor of San Fran uh, Los Angeles, one of those California cities, right? Which one? Yeah. Was it Sacramento? The, the one that's five times bigger than <laughs> that. <laughs> that one. Uh, six years ago in 2005 and uh, in June became president of the US Conference of Mayors where you've made education part of the central agenda of the organization. Would you? Yes. Uh, just a brief sense of the scale of the Los Angeles uh, the unified school district. It's, it's hard to wrap your mind around I think the size of that, of that um, system. It has 678,441 students, unless you also count the adult education programs, in which case it has more than a million students. Uh, 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 and it employs 68,000 people with an operating budget of, I think, more than $5 billion a year, um, which would make it, I think, one of the largest cities in the country on top of everything else on its own. I don't know if it would be bigger than San Francisco. Um, <laughs> Much bigger. <laughs> uh, to his right is Mayor Cory uh, Booker of, of Newark. Um, uh, I came across a wonderful quote um, uh, in a commencement speech you gave this spring from your grandfather, uh, whom you quoted saying to you after your own graduation, I think after several of your own graduations, you are living, the, you are living a life that was a dangerous dream when I was your age growing up. Um, and his own record of educational achievement is kind of a dream. You have a BA and a master's from Stanford, a BA from Oxford where you're a Rhodes Scholar, and a law degree from Yale. Um, and we lost to UCLA every time we went down and played. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> caught a few catches in Rose Bowl. But, right. Uh, right, not that that wasn't without its disappointments. Yes. So. Um, uh, Cory Booker served as a lawyer for the Urban Justice Center in Newark. You were elected to the city council in 1998 yes. um, uh, and served four years yes. um, and has now been mayor of Newark for five years this month, I five think. Five years, July 1st. Um, Newark is the largest school system in New Jersey, uh, though it is quite small compared to Los Angeles, as almost everything is. Uh, it has 39,400 students, 7,000 employees, and an operating budget of 800 million dollars. Yeah, eight, nine hundred million. I'd, I'd like to just start out the conversation. That's a, that I just gave a very, the, the most bare bones statistical portrait of your school systems. And I'd, I'd love just to hear a few paragraphs from each of you on how you think about the, the particular demography set of challenges presented by um, uh, the student body in, 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 your, in your district, either in, in terms of um, how many kids are on free or reduced lunch, what the um, ethnic mix in the schools is, uh, what the, give us a portrait of, of your school system. Do you want to start? Please, Please go ahead. Well, we have, um, 
about 90%, 94%, 92% the kids are kids of color. They come from either Latin America, uh, Asia, or Africa. Uh, we have the least penetration of middle class kids of any school big school district uh, in the country. Uh, we have more kids on the school lunch program percentage wise uh, than most places, uh, about 75%. Uh, in the schools that I operate, uh, I have 21 schools, the lowest performing schools in LA, uh, it's closer to 95%. Um, many challenges. We have more kids that are homeless in our school district than any school district in the country. More kids on foster, uh, more foster kids than any school district in the country and the percentage of both is very high. So we have many, many challenges and yet uh, we both part from uh, the position that these kids can learn. Uh, that yes, uh, it's more difficult uh, to teach them. It was more difficult to teach me than it would be my son. Uh, but because I grew up in those circumstances and I can read and write. Um, I'll let you uh, explain your um, demography and then I kind of want to share with you why I think this issue is so important if we could. Well, I'd, I'd love to get back into that. And I, and mine is the same. I mean, we're a majority minority city, 80, 90 percent, uh, overwhelming majority below the poverty line qual qualifying for federal and uh, a stu a student lunch programs. Um, so a lot of the very similar demographics. Uh, we, we, are, we have a more African-American uh, population, but a, a booming and growing Latino population. Um, the reason why I'm interested to hear uh, your next comment is, we, in the previous panel where there were three mayors, we talked about how much we learn from each other and how much we look to each other. Um, Antonio was one of those courageous mayors because all mayors do not control their school systems. And if you talk to the Broad Foundation and others, and something I've come to believe very strongly, is you cannot control these large, sprawling bureaucracies through committees uh, of people who are often having very dramatically different uh, motivations, um, uh, people that they answer to. They're extremely low turnout elections. And Antonio, I watched very closely because he was one of those courageous mayors. And, and to, to be very blunt, I've talked to other mayors who say, I don't want a part of that. Um, but Antonio was one of those courageous mayors that stepped up and said, uh, I'm going to fight. I don't care. I'm going to risk political capital. And I'm going to fight because I think that centralized control. Imagine running a, a city police department with a committee of people. Uh, imagine running uh, uh, your transportation system with a committee of people. And where real change and innovation is happening is where mayors step up to say, I'm going to take responsibility. Did you want to, uh, this is actually where I wanted the conversation to go next to the, to, to the issue you raised, which is that mayors around the country have very different tools at their disposal to try to do something about this. There's some who have no authority over the schools whatsoever, some who have direct authority over the superintendent ability to hire and fire. Um, and I'd, I'd be very interested to hear you each talk about, and, and Mayor Villaraigosa, why don't we start with you? You've each been at the job for five years, at least five years, and and my sense of both of your um, efforts in the job has been there's been some time spent figuring out what are the points of leverage for you as mayor. How can you find ways to affect change? And um, you referred earlier to to, to um, the LA schools under your control, which is one of those elements. But can, can you talk a little more about other sorts of tools? Well, I'd like to kind of set the predicate here, yep. if I could, uh, about why I'm so passionate about this issue. Uh, I went to Catholic school for part of my life and public school uh, when I was kicked out of uh, Catholic school. Uh, I dropped out of high school, grew up in a home of high poverty. I was a home of domestic violence and grew up with a single mom. And I tell people uh, it was a Catholic school that gave me a foundation, but it was a public school that gave me a second chance. And what you see, I went to a high school where 75% of the kids were dropping out. And today, what, 40 some odd years later, uh, in, in those same high schools, 65% of the kids are dropping out. What you hear so often from the apologist uh, for public education in our urban areas is that, Mr. Villaraigosa, you don't understand. These kids are poor. Uh, these kids are in the school lunch program. Uh, they're English language learners. Uh, they, they have foster kids. You know, I tell people, take a look at me. Uh, I grew up in that, uh, in that kind of a setting. I can read and write. Uh, I went to UCLA and law school after that. These kids can learn. So we part from the position 
that we can be the change agents that really set a higher bar. So with respect uh, to this issue for me, uh, it's an issue that runs deep inside of me and, and it's why I've made this issue uh, one of uh, my most important. I think you look at uh, education reform today and you look at what's going on and there's too many apologists for the lack of success. 50% dropout rate in LA, uh, in some of our schools about 65%. 80% of the kids scoring at the bottom 20 percentile. This is what we're looking at in urban schools uh, around the country. And I've heard Antonio, I think the framing of the problem, um, it cannot be framed enough, and, and I've heard Antonio talk about it. He's a mayor of mayors in, in America, just so you know. He's the head of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and um, was very, uh, I think, showed great leadership in saying that this is a national security issue. Uh, in fact, the biggest threat to our democracy by far is our inability to educate uh, children in America. Uh, if you look at great civilizations from the fall of the Roman Empire to the fall of the city uh, of Jerusalem uh, in, in, in the year 70, all of them usually don't fall simply from external threat, it's from internal corruption, from an inability to live up to their ideals and to make their societies vibrant. Education is critical to that in this country in a global knowledge-based economy where you have your major population bases. Again, these guys um, were saying on our panel yesterday how much of America's population now is represented. Uh, over 80% of Americans live directly in cities or, or in their immediate suburbs. And when cities as a whole, he says a 50% graduation rate. We brag about in Newark a higher graduation rate than that, but I know the reality. It's masking the truth. Only about 22 to 25 percent of my kids could pass uh, the minimum competency test for graduation. It's called the HESPA in New Jersey. It's an eighth grade standard. If you don't graduate that way, you get this other graduation, used to be called a substantial review and assessment. Uh, which is a watered-down version. HESPA is testing eighth grade standards. The head of my community college tells me that our honor students uh, have to take remedial classes. They're not college ready. Uh, we will not be able to compete. The majority of our workforce will look like, in, in about 50 years, will be the populations that are in Newark and Los Angeles. The majority of workforce, our very economy, our national well-being, will be dependent upon uh, the people that are not being educated in our schools. So this is a profound problem, and the urgency is not being felt in America. The urgency is just not being expressed. I got a great opportunity to go to speak to an L.A. school. I went in there, and I couldn't believe it. I had a bigger endowment than most colleges. It was Harvard-Westlake. And, 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 you know, and it I, is a college. It is, and, and, and to see the opportunities that these young people are getting, and some of them are scholar students, the majority obviously are not, but to nurture their mind. And what Antonio is saying is so true because you know, there's a young lady here, uh, uh, Miss Gersh, who, Miss Gersh, yeah, poker, because I am talking about her now, who is from a KIPP school in my city called Spark Academy, uh, taking really the same population of children uh, and showing that there's no excuses whatsoever. Every child, no matter what their background, there are schools in LA, there are schools in Newark that are showing that it can work. And so the challenge for us and the frustration for us is it's not a matter anymore of can we it's not a matter of uh, do we have the capacity, but what we're lacking in America is a, is a sense of urgency and the national will to deal with this problem. And the, and the challenge is, as we talk about a, a government spending, what we've done in, in, in California, for example, with, with our failure in our education system, we're paying for it in such dramatic ways. The, the California prison system is billions and billions of dollars, same with New Jersey, uh, courts, you name it, because a child in this economy that does not graduate from high school, the chances of them going to prison, black and Latino, uh, are the chances of them being dependent upon the state uh, for resources is dramatic. So what, what, uh, what, and I'm getting back to sort of more of the point of question, what I, uh, it's unfortunate to me because I do think that we've structured public education in an unsustainable way. I think education is a sector that we've allowed to languish back in the agrarian age where we have not brought in innovations, we have not brought in change. We've allowed everybody's interests but the child's to be served first, leaving so many of our children left out of the game. We've allowed perverse realities to exist uh, where our children uh, go to school uh, 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 in, in for a number of hours. It's nowhere, uh, nowhere uh, commensurate with our, uh, our competitor economies abroad. And, and we haven't seen any kind of change. And so from labor laws to uh, uh, time on task, 
to um, the leadership and uh, models. You, there's no entity, business, entertainment, uh, you name it, that would structure themselves the way we structure public education in the United States. So the only way I sort of break through that as a mayor of Newark was I need to find some way to leverage authority and control. And my first, with the, with the Democratic governors, there was no pathway to doing that. I was, I was Just to make sure everybody knows, the state took over control of, of the Newark system back in 1995. 1995, and right. And replaced the school board with a, an advisory board that the New York Times has called mostly toothless, which is well, the, not the, a great the, image. Well, they, re, they didn't replace the advisory board. They just made it an advisory board with really no power. So they took local control away to the state, but then they did really nothing with it. And frankly, my uh, assertion is it was politics. What Democratic governor would really want to rock the cradle uh, in their main, in the largest political base in the state of New Jersey. They would really want to go on and take sacred cows. So what we saw is when a Republican governor came in, and a guy who I don't, I always say I can write a dissertation on our disagreements, but, but the, the truth of the matter is, he came in and he was elected on a, on, a, on a Tuesday night. Wednesday morning, he was in the highest performing school in my large county, which has Montclair, West Orange, more affluent towns. He showed up in the highest performing school, which happened to be a Newark charter school, uh, and said, he basically said it's a moral affront uh, that our state would spend the amount of money it's spending on public education and getting the kind of returns when we're standing in a school that is showing that there is a way forward. And I jumped on that opportunity. I went and talked to him and said, let's partner, forget partisanship. Let's find a way to be, to, if you give me more uh, influence in it, let's find a way to make Newark, the, which we are, we're a microcosm of what Los Angeles is. Let's let Newark be sort of a, 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 vest, a, vest, a, a vesticle for um, for innovation, for reform, and for change. And that's really what started my more direct impact on education. Before that, frankly, uh, I found ways around the margins to make a difference. We found a, a group of philanthropists around the country and we said, let's see if we can rapidly expand a high quality charter space in an American city to build the charter space uh, to a significant proportion. And we created a $20 million fund in Newark uh, with the help of uh, some people who are out here at, at the Aspen Institute this week. Uh, to see if we can grow the charter school space. We said, let's find the best models for kids at risk of dropping out in America and fund them. And we partnered with uh, a lot of different organizations to create five models uh, about a few years ago that are doing like big picture school and others that are doing extraordinary work. But it wasn't until now that we had really a chance to attack the meat of the issue and see if we can truly change uh, errors. And I'll end with this and let, it go, let Anthony make some comments. With a stroke of a pen, last week we ended something, this shows what leadership can do. Something called um, uh, um, a forced placement. If I'm, a, if I'm a principal, what we've done to American public schools is we've taken principals who should be the, the education leaders in the United States, and we've eviscerated their authority and their power. Uh, most principals in public ed schools in America are told what their floor plan is, who they have to hire, if they think they need extra reading coaches, they can't get it done. They're told that they have to fulfill so much bureaucracy, paperwork, and you name it. Um, they're really saddled with so many other duties that have nothing to do with their, their jobs. And they can't choose their team. Imagine any of us leading or managing an organization where you can't choose your team. And they have no control over money spent. About 95% of the money spent in our, in our public schools, the principals had no authority of. So we said, let's end this right now. And with a stroke of a pen, we just changed a policy that I think every school should pay, change. And it's the end of forced placement. No principal should have to take any teacher into their school that they don't want. And uh, ending the dance of the lemons in Newark, New Jersey, uh, and basically saying that um, that, the, the, that principal's in charge of building the team that they need. Now, this is there's no quick. This is the thing everybody was looking for. What's the big flavor of the month? What's the big light switch I can flick? There's there's no quick fix to our schools. There's no one uh, uh, fancy solution. It is of many many different things that we should be changing and working on and focusing on that creates dramatically different student outcomes. And and so in Newark, that's really what we're focusing on now. Can you talk a little bit more about the partnership for LA schools and how that has worked as an instrument for you to try to change the way education is delivered there? Well, let me set the background okay. for how we got there. First of all, I went to school uh, in California when we had the best public schools in the United States of America. Uh, we, uh, coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, were also in the top five in per pupil spending. I am not a demagogue. Uh, we're now uh, 47th, uh, 48th in per, pu per pupil spending. We're at the bottom of virtually every indicia, whether it's technology in our classroom, librarians, counselors, nurses, at the bottom, right there with Mississippi. Uh, we do need to fund our schools without question. But one of the things I've argued is uh, before we can go to the taxpayers of the state 
and convince them that we need to spend more. We've got to do more with the money that we have. I think uh, when you look at great neighborhoods, if any of you, when you're, when you're going to buy a home, what's the first thing you ask a real estate agent? What kind of public school uh, is in that neighborhood? Uh, because uh, a great neighborhood is anchored by a great public school. A great city, uh, a city-state like ours, has to be anchored by great public schools. And that's no longer the case for us. So I, I actually, as soon as I got elected, I went to the legislature. I used to be Speaker of the Assembly, had a little juice still. Uh, and I asked for uh, a partnership with the school district. By our Constitution and our, and our city charter, they bifurcate uh, those two entities. I got uh, legislation signed by uh, it was Democrats and Republicans. I got it passed by one vote because of the power of the teachers' union there. Even though I used to be speaker and I pretty much used to get everything I wanted, uh, it was a battle. Uh, I got to partner with the school district to pick the superintendent, to evaluate that superintendent. We lost on, a, uh, on appeal. Uh, they sued. Uh, we lost on appeal. Uh, I then uh, had to take on uh, the teachers union, and this is what I've said. By the way, I worked for them for eight years. I am not anti-union. I just was, you know, I, I, I believe in collective bargaining, but I also believe that uh, when their interests merge with the public interest, then I'm for it. When it's just putting uh, the interest of adults and not kids, I can't be for it. And so uh, I had to raise a lot of money, uh, about uh, $7 million, the most expensive school board races in U.S. history, to elect a reform board that gave uh, a couple of things. In, in the six years I've been mayor, we've doubled the size, uh, doubled the number of charters. We have more kids uh, in charter schools, about uh, 75,000 than any other school district. Um, with my chart, with, I was able to get uh, a group of schools, uh, my partnership schools. I, what I said was, everybody said, well, the mayor's doing this because he's running for governor. So he just wants to, he's going to get the highest performing schools and he's going to pick them up a bit and, you know, kind of run on that. So I took on, I did the opposite. I took on the lowest performing schools, the most violent middle school in Los Angeles and Watts. It was a school where 120 kids had been arrested on campus, middle school, not outside of the campus. In the first two years, and we're going to get another report card in August, we've outperformed the school district and the state uh, in those schools uh, on average. Uh, we, have, uh, we have two great charter schools, uh, the Alliance and Green Dot. Uh, they've had a 40-point average increase in those two years. Green Dot at 38, we're at a 36. Uh, we, have, we have that even though we still have, we don't have the flexibility of charters. Our partnership schools have the same thick union contract which only enunciates what, what rights teachers have and I helped to negotiate that contract way back when. Uh, so uh, I am complicit here. Uh, but doesn't talk about responsibilities and one of the things we've argued is is that we, as we reform our schools, as we look at uh, putting kids first, we all got to start from the proposition that we all have rights, but responsibilities are attached to those rights and roles are attached. So in our schools, uh, we, ha we have a parent center in every school. Parents are empowered. Uh, we, we ask them, we can't force them, we, but we ask them when we're changing the culture where the parents have to sign a parent compact what their responsibilities are, much as you would at Harvard West Lake or you know, a charter school. Uh, we Teachers uh, get more decision-making uh, around curriculum based on the core standards. Uh, and importantly, principals get to make decisions. Now, we don't have mutual consent, and we're looking for that. Uh, the idea, uh, and so what we, we had, uh, we had to sue the school district, uh, the union, and uh, on an equal protection argument because we had all of the least senior teachers in our schools and with all the cutbacks we were losing 50 percent of our teachers when the other schools were losing three percent and we said that's not fair why should poor kids get uh, you know cut that way get long-term subs instead of teachers that are going to be there and the problem in our schools and something that we just got the conference of mayors thanks uh, to you, uh, Corey, and uh, Mayor Johnson from Sacramento and myself, 
We got a unanimous um, resolution uh, for the following. Uh, to take on the issue of seniority, because in our schools today, and tenure, in our schools today, seniority drives assignments, transfers, and layoffs. Now look, performance isn't taken into account at all. You could have the best teacher in a school, and they're going to get laid off if they're there a year. And so we also said, you know, you ought to be able to earn sen uh, tenure. We either eliminate it or earn it, and, it, and then you've got to re-earn it. This idea that you have a job for life, no matter what your performance is like, just isn't working. It would be nice for Yeah. 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 Well, I, I tell people, I said, gee, I'd like to run again on, on the, you know, on, on, the, yeah, on the platform that I've been here six years. You ought to vote for me again. But, you but know? teacher tenure historically in L.A. has been granted automatically after two years, right? Just to get it. Automatically. Yeah. And it, it, you want to hear this? They're based on STOL, what they call STOLs, evaluations, in-class observations, in the classroom. If you ask the vast majority of teachers, when's the last time a principal's been in your classroom, they'll say, well, they haven't. And yet they're getting uh, an automatic evaluation of satisfactory. In fact, 97.3% of teachers in LA Unified and throughout the state, it's a little higher in the state, get a satisfactory evaluation. It's hard to believe you have any problems. Well, I mean, so, so as a result, uh, we're focusing on multiple measure evaluations. I know that you are as well, where we look at student growth over time. You ought to be responsible for how, where that kid started and where they ended up after a year. We're looking at install, in, evaluate, uh, uh, in class observations, peer review. You know, good teachers know who good teachers are and they know who our ineffective teachers are. And, you know, I'll tell you, this is what they always say. I don't want their kids because they want the kids of the teacher who's really been, uh, you know, uh, accelerating uh, their growth. The, uh, the statistics show that an average teacher is 50% more effective than a poor-performing teacher, and a high-performing teacher is 50% uh, more effective than an average teacher. So... Teacher effectiveness is critical. It's the most important thing that you could do. I want to do it in partnership with teachers and their unions. But what we've said is we're going to move ahead because we got to put kids first, not the interest of adults, when uh, they frankly hurt uh, kids uh, currently in our schools. But this is what gets me so upset. Now, forgive me, because no, how could we be in 2011 and have such a moral outrage? that districts all over the United States of America, people are getting tenure for just breathing. And, 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 and that's it. I mean, we, we weren't using our tenure system. We came in and saw that we weren't making decisions. We weren't really e even using the law that we had already to evaluate teachers and see how well they're doing. This is what we're facing in this country. And honestly, we're getting the school systems that we deserve because most of our nation is checked out of these issues. They hear them in forums like this and they think this sounds absurd, but we, we really have a disconnect between the consciousness of our country and, the, and what I consider the carnage of human potential that's happening within our public school systems. And, and that is a big problem. And, and until we start realizing that the house is on fire, uh, that we need all hands on deck to put it out, we're going to continue to see this because Honestly, I think the pendulum is swinging a little bit and there's more momentum to school reform, but every day he's getting knives in his back uh, by, the, by the forces of resistance and does not have the support. And I see mayors around this country and what they face when they do stand up and say, let's make change, let's make reform. But you said in your, in your um, State of the City address this year that you, had, you and, and, and the leader of the teachers union in Newark had reached, a, you both agreed that tenure shouldn't be the default position. Right. What do you mean by that, and, and, and what is the nature of your uh, own partnership with, with the union? Then? Well, again, so why did it take until two, my 2011 State of the City speech to start talking about these issues and pushing them into the, into the public conversation in, in Newark, New Jersey, uh, to really take on the issue of look at the tenure laws we have. And this was my conversation with uh, our union leader, who I have found to be, I mean, he's poured uh, enough money into my campaign to have me uh, happily retire with Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so that's how much they fought me to keep me out of office on my various races. Um, but we finally sat down and stopped vilifying each other and just listen to each other. And he had a lot of the same frustrations that uh, Antonio's uh, uh, pointing out right now. 
about, you know, all, teachers know who the bad teachers are. I found this out by having, going to visit teachers in their schools and uh, people that I had gotten friendships with. I said, are there bad teachers in this school? And they'll look around left and right and they'll say to me, you know, yes, there absolutely are. There are people that just, sh this should not be their profession. They're good people, uh, but they're not contributing to, to, to the school. They're, they're, t they're pulling down our schools. And now that we've been raising accountability in Newark, there's an urgency amongst our teaching corps uh, to demonstrate that, that, and they're getting beat. They feel like they're getting beat up on, uh, beat down, and they really this urgency that we want to demonstrate excellence. So our our teachers union ahead uh, 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 really challenged me and said, you, you know, you have some tenure laws now that could work for you, but you just don't use them. My teachers don't even know when they're up for tenure. They get letters, you know, uh, uh, months and months into the fact that they've been tenured, alerting them that they've been tenured. My teachers are not getting professional tra training and development. They're not getting principals that come in and actually sit in their classroom and help them. It's imagine dropping any of us that don't have teaching experience into a class. We would need help. We would need people letting us know what happens. So what we did is we fired dozens and dozens of teachers this year. We had the budget pressure to get rid of them, but we got rid of them not based upon how long you've been in, 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 uh, in, in the job, but first and foremost on what have your evaluations been saying about you already? Because for too many times, people were getting mediocre evaluations were just being passed on to tenure. And so, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a contract negotiation coming up. And, you know, I've talked to Randy uh, about it. I've talked to who's our, who's our uh, the AFT head, uh, Randy Weingarten, the AFT head, head uh, nationally. And I've talked to Joe Del Grasso, our, our local guy. And I'm actually looking forward. I'm not naive, but I'm looking forward uh, to sitting down with them at the table because they have told me that we have the same goal as you, Mayor. We want to make Newark, New Jersey a national model in every way. Uh, so, you know, we're doing things, we, we announced in my State of the City address that we're going to take on the battle to make our system system-wide, expanded learning time, expand the day, hopefully expand the year. Uh, we'll start with 18 pilot programs. We only have 70-some-odd uh, schools, so we'll start with uh, 18 schools next year. Um, but I'm really hoping that we can come up with a teacher's contract that will break through a lot of these things that are ridiculous that are in a teacher contract. And the last example I'll give you, just to affirm this in a real-life example, Wall Street Journal wrote about it, Arts High School in my city, this amazing teacher who was just lighting the school on fire, lifting the, the energy there. Uh, when we had budget cuts last year, uh, he was the first one fired. Now, who hired him? Uh, it was a charter school. Picked him up right away. And so when we were doing our citywide forums on education, after we got uh, a, a generous do donation from uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who I did afterwards friend on Facebook, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we held citywide forums on, on, on reform and change, and we had public school teachers sitting with charter school teachers, public school principals sitting with charter school principals, and the public school principals didn't see the charter schools as a, as a threat. They just said, give us the same level playing field. Let me have the same power and control over my school as they have. And so that's one thing we're really pushing to do, is to find ways to liberate our public school principals in the way that our charter school principals are. I want to say one more thing about the union, because we're actually in a different situation. I worked for them for eight years. Uh, they actually spent uh, more than a million dollars to get me elected mayor. So when you see that I've, I'm taking them on uh, in the way that I have, uh, it's not because I'm against unions or unappreciative of their support. But what I've said to them, this issue is too critical to uh, LA's economic competitiveness, uh, to the nation's uh, stature around the world. It's, it's the economic issue of our time, as I said yesterday, the democracy issue of our time, and the civil rights issue of our time. Because when you look at LA as an example, I mean, uh, I mean Latinos are going to be, uh, what, 50%? They're already uh, the, the number, the largest uh, ethnic group in the state. We're going to be a million down uh, in uh, college graduates by, 2050, uh, by 2020. If we're in, we'll have a, we need a million more graduates to keep up, to keep up uh, with the, the, the economic needs. And so what I've said to them is they got to get out of the way of uh, really defending a broken system. And here's uh, some examples of that. Um, it, it actually, it, because so much of the laws are generated from the state, We've had to go to the state to address, uh, to propose uh, changes to seniority and tenure. Uh, they, in, in our school district, which is the largest school district in the state, uh, we've done a thing called public school choice, you know, with them completely opposed. And what we've said is, 
every failing school, every new school that gets built has to compete for an operator. That operator could be a charter school, it could be a hybrid like mine, which is a, the, the partnership schools. Uh, it could be a teacher collaborative, but it's got to be focused on metrics-driven accountability results. So they've got to put a plan together uh, that indicates how they're going to move uh, that school uh, to beyond where it is uh, currently. Now, the teachers' union has completely opposed public school choice. We're not going to have 100 of the 700-plus schools uh, in public school choice, and we're going to keep on moving ahead. If we had a better partnership with them, and we don't currently, uh, we could do so much more because I believe, as you do, that teachers need to be ahead of this reform movement. If you ask teachers, do you think that, perform that seniority should be the only decision point for assignments, transfers, and layoffs? more than 65% of them, close to 70% of them will say, absolutely not. Performance should be taken into account, and yet it's not taken into account. The only people taking that position uh, you know, are union leaders and, and the union. And, and that's what's really hurting our ability to innovate, our ability to have choices. Uh, I, I've said to the charter movement who just gave me you know, legis uh, leader of the year or whatever, I said, I would, my job is to put you out of business. And what I meant by that is, uh, I want innovation and flexibility and high expectations uh, throughout our public schools. Uh, but we can't do that uh, in the current situation that we have. And so, uh, in my situation, I've, we've been in, involved in a great battle. And it's a battle uh, that I intend to stay involved in even beyond this. I, I mean, I'm operating as if this is the end of the line. And I've told people, you know, you, you can't get elected to anything uh, with the teachers' union on the other end. But uh, what, in California. In California. Uh, Please but, don't say that. Please don't say that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I honestly believe that the only way we're going to move ahead uh, is by beginning to, to win the, the hearts and minds of teachers. What's happening in L.A. today because of public school choice, there's a group of teachers within the teachers' union they're called New TLA. Our teachers' union is called UTLA. They're called New TLA. And they're, they're getting behind a lot of these reforms and saying, yeah, we ought to take performance into account. Yes, we ought to have multiple measures for evaluation. Yes, I want a good, strong teacher next to me. Yes, we ought to be able to earn seniority. So there's a growing sentiment among teachers. They want to lift the standards of the profession so that we can and and should pay them a lot more uh, and honor a profession that I think most of us agree. You wouldn't be here at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday if you didn't think this was an important issue. You didn't come to hear Corey and Antonio speak. This is the most important challenge facing the nation. And we can and should move ahead with reforms, but we could do it with them or, or we could do it without them. But people like us are going to move ahead. Um, I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm going to open it up to you guys after one more question um, to Mayor Booker, which is I'd like you to hear a little more about what's happening with the Zuckerberg money and, the, and in general the effort to turn to private resources to reinforce what's happening in the schools. That's a very complex political undertaking. And I, I wonder if you have any, in a sense, philosophically regret about it. I mean, given everything you guys have said about how this is a public emergency for the country, um, why shouldn't we be making resources available as, 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 as citizens, um, in, in, as in our public capacity as citizens, rather than having to turn to private resources for our public schools? Well, first of all, not, nowhere near public regret. In, in fact, completely the opposite. Um, um, thrilled, and it's a matching grant. We've still got about another $50 million to go. Um, every innovation that my city, we were saying in the last panel, is doing from uh, transforming our parks system to uh, empowering re-entry re programs have been a result of multi-layered partnership, government playing roles, uh, community-based organizations playing roles, uh, philanthropists, venture philanthropists I call them, playing roles. Philanthropy has been, from the very beginning of our country, 
uh, a mechanism by which to leverage dramatic social change. And you know, you can't always wait for the government to uh, to 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 lead. Sometimes you have to get private citizenry coming together. That's the tradition I come from in the African American tradition in the United States, from freedom schools to uh, to Tuskegee Institute, you name it. Uh, uh, the private sector often has to lead the way uh, and be followed. Uh, but in this case, it's a, it's a real partnership that we're looking to do, and a partnership between clergy. Uh, uh, community-based organizations, uh, other layers of government, uh, philanthropists and the like. And so what we're trying to leverage philanthropy to do to help us to embrace innovations quicker than we could uh, as a whole. So let's give an example of uh, two examples. I just said that we're looking to do uh, ex massive expansion of ex uh, a learning time. And that's something that takes a lot. We'll have to negotiate with the teachers and, and a lot of other things to slowly get there. So in the meantime, to bridge us to that moment, let's jump in right now with philanthropy to expand learning time and use that as a leverage. New school startups, you know, there are tremendous models all around the country of schools that have uh, belied the average, are going to high poverty area, uh, was facing lots of challenges, but they're showing that it can work and are looking to replicate. Well, we want to replicate those models in Newark. Our kids should have the best access to schools. So I talked to, I was out when I was out in California last week talking to a few of the greatest school leader, innovative school leaders uh, that there were, rocket chip schools, uh, rocket schools and uh, uh, Aspire and a few others uh, uh, who, who we don't have in New Jersey yet. Uh, they would love to come to Newark, New Jersey, but you know what? It's going to take startup capital to get them started. So philanthropy can fill a very important gap to help us become uh, 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 sort of, uh, again, as I said, sort of the receptacle nationally for innovation uh, and help us move much more quickly than government often can do. So th there's, there's no regret. In fact, I think there is a responsibility. Those of us who are Americans, I say this time and time again, you, we, we, there, nobody here in this room uh, got here uh, uh, by their own making. All of us are received the riches from our ancestors. As I always say, we drink deeply from wells of freedom and liberty that we did not dig. And so ours is not just to, to, be a, to sort of sit back on our couch uh, and wait for the government to solve all of our problems. That has never happened in the United States of America. We need to lead. And in fact, our passivity, our inaction, our lack of engagement has allowed our problems to fester to the point with which they are now a cancer on our, on our country. And so this is a time that demands more private individuals, be they uh, guys like I see in my city who work full-time jobs and come after school and work and, and coaching sports teams, whether it's, uh, whether it's business people who will go in for uh, and mentor kids, or whether it's philanthropists that have the means by which to make strategic investments uh, in, 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 uh, under the leadership, the guidance, and the public uh, transparency of, of elected and appointed actors, uh, but that's so critical. So let's let's start. And I love this is why again I, I have such a, a lot of respect for Antonio's leadership on a national level now. But when I watch his local um, his local work, I love how he's just not a vil. There's people, governors, that come and love to vilify everybody, uh, play bad. This is the bad people used to blame. What Antonio is saying is, I'm going to bring everybody to the table. Um, we're not, I'm not going to tolerate uh, you putting anything before kids, whether you're union or whatever. I'm not going to bash the union. You, need to, you have a role to play at the table, just like the private sector. And I work with uh, uh, some of the philanthropists in this city that are very in, involved uh, in, the, in the work that he does. And that's what we need to do in America. We need to bring everybody back to the table. But right now, everybody's gotten away from the table. They've gotten away from the home. Uh, they don't even know what's going on in the room. And left in the room are politicians who are getting their, their, their hats handed to them by interests that are not serving our children. We also have raised uh, $65 million for the partnership, the, the 21 schools, with the partnership schools. It's been very, very important uh, to us. Uh, philanthropy, frankly, has been uh, particularly important where in our anti-gang initiatives, in, um, in efforts that we have that are best practices, where we've, we've been able uh, to attract uh, philanthropic dollars. Uh, by the way, that school that I said, uh, I, I realized that I didn't mention the school that I said that we, uh, 120 kids were arrested on campus. After the first year, less than 20 were arrested. After the second year, uh, around 10. And this year, around 10 uh, will be arrested. And importantly, we're, we've lowered the number of kids uh, that we're expelling. So we're not, we're not c cutting down the crime in these schools by expelling kids. We're embracing them. But, uh, we're working with them, and we're working with their parents. But why, why very, is a room full of people not gasping that we're bragging about 10? 
and this is the thing that Antonio and I know, and, and Antonio's walked this, this life more than I have. I always say that my father, and I saw Wes Moore who was here before, my father lived this, and he always says, one little different thing that could have happened, I could have been in prison, uh, as opposed to, uh, to being an IBM executive. He came uh, from a single family home, mother couldn't take care of him, raised by the community, taken in by people, wasn't, didn't think he was going to go to college because he couldn't afford it, random re residents, philanthropists. That was my life. Put, put, uh, exactly, put dollar bills in, in, in envelopes and handed it to him so he could pay his first semester tuition before he can get a job. So, but for the grace of God. But how can we understand, this is the thing, this is a national statistic. There are thousands of people and kids in this country put by single mothers, like my father's mother, like Antonio's mother, on the waiting list for big brothers and big sisters. Four hours a month, that's all it takes to mentor one child. One child from this school that he's talking about that has a mentor, his chances of being involved in anything criminal go to the floor. His academic performance me measures go up. Unsafe sex practices, making babies when you're a baby, go dramatically down. Four hours. The amount of time we spend watching The Real Housewives of New Jersey, Jersey Licious, <laughs> Jersey Shore, um, um, uh, to, to, to spend mentoring a child. So why can I go to Harvard Westlake that is a few miles away from some of your lowest performing schools and see the love we give to those children and yet we, we do not share that same love with the kids that are going and, and not understanding that those kids who are going to Harvard Leslie right now, their destinies are interwoven with the destinies of the kids going to that school. Why have we not set the bar of expectations so much higher uh, and we could eviscerate these problems. Antonio had an army of people in one of the wealthiest uh, um, cities on the globe who said, you know what, we're not going to tolerate it. The, the reality is we know this for kids, that, that your, your expectation state for children will also, often mark their destiny. Well, I'm going to say this for our country. The expectation state we have for our, 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 uh, for our schools and for our system is going to set the determination. We tolerate a level of failure in this country that is shockingly uh, uh, abhorrent to me. I, I do not understand. And when I, you know, I, I lived in uh, public housing projects for, for eight years. I moved across the street from a school uh, that the principal, when I first moved there, was telling me he had a system to get the kids off the playground uh, rapidly if a stolen car or, or if shooting started. And what, what angers me about America is that it's our poverty problem. And it's not poverty in terms of material poverty. There will be that for a long time. But it's the poverty in America that, that angers me is our poverty of compassion, our poverty of love, and, and our poverty of action. Um, I'd like to open it up now uh, to you guys. Please, please do ask a, a single and, and direct question that this issue, for very good reasons, lends itself to to speech making, but I'd like to preserve as much time as possible to hear from, from the mayor. So I, there are microphones in the room. Sir, back there, why don't, we, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Can you just comment on the, um, the effectiveness and the role that uh, an organization like Teach for America is playing in your, in your school systems? Teach for America is one of the great uh, organizations involved in education reform in our country. Uh, but I can tell you that with the cutbacks, uh, in the city because of the state cut packs where we get the vast majority of our money, almost all of them uh, are gone. Uh, they're now in charter schools. Uh, they were laid off even when they were the best performing, and not all of them were best performing, but, he, but many of them were. Uh, so that's why this issue of seniority is so important and why performance should drive these decisions. We've, we pretty much in L.A. have completely driven out the Teach for America uh, students. Uh, TFA is, is still alive in the city of Newark and we're trying to use, do things like mutual consent that have an impact for TFA students because of a principal does, has, was, will not hire other people. We're trying to find ways to place TFA students. We have a large and growing charter sector, section, sector that's growing in leaps and bounds, frankly. And one of the biggest problems of our charter schools is recruiting teachers. Uh, I, I literally get on the phone uh, for, uh, for any school, uh, public or private, public, private, or charter, to recruit teachers to my city because I know the impact that one teacher can make. And so TFA is a pipeline a powerful pipeline of getting some of our best and brightest in this country into the profession. And what's great about TFA, and people criticize TFA, but there's one criticism that's probably I hear most is, is their retention rates in the profession. But the reality is I love it. Imagine if we had a national service initiative in America 
where, where you had a, a, a panoply of choices, but we were getting more and more people from top universities or tops of their class, I don't care if it's top university or not, uh, uh, getting into the teaching profession. Even if they stay two or three years, um, they're going to carry those experiences on to, to their jobs as business people, as lawyers, medical profession, policy makers, and it's going to have a powerful effect. So TFA alum in my city are doing incredible things, starting schools, uh, uh, finding other ways to start nonprofits uh, uh, that, help our, that help our city. So I'm a huge TFA fan, and we're going to try to expand the newer core even more so in the future. Yes, please, right here. It takes it. Yeah. Uh, the teachers generally were outraged with uh, Waiting for Superman, the documentary that surfaced last year. I wondered what kind of reaction that you've uh, realized in, among your teachers and what you've done about it if you've gotten a negative reaction. I was outraged as well, uh, but for probably different reasons. Uh, I was outraged that we have uh, the dance of the lemons uh, that we have with teachers and principals, by the way. Uh, I'm outraged that these kids uh, and that little boy Anthony, I, I cried, I saw that movie three times and every time, and maybe because I didn't have a father, every time I cried when I saw that boy walk up to his bed and, and that picture of his father and I knew that that's what he was going to, uh, that picture is what he was going to put up on his wall. And I'll tell you something, that Anthony deserves uh, a great education. And the problem with too many the, the defenders of the status quo is they don't want to admit uh, that these kids are failing in numbers that are disproportionate to what a great society uh, should uh, allow. And what they don't want to admit is that all of us are part of the problem and part of the solution. I don't just dump on teachers as principals, it's political leaders, it's the business community, it's all of us. Who, you know, I always ask, when's the last time you've been in a school? And the answer, you know, for somebody else's child, not for your own. We expect you to go on. You know, we should all be reaching out and being mentors and being involved. And if you have the means of investing in philanthropic efforts that have results, you know, in our school. So I'm sorry that, that people were outraged by it. I didn't see it. I saw it as balanced. I, I did not see it. In, and I've heard that it was anti-union. I did not see it as anti-union. I'm certainly not anti-union. Uh, but I know that a lot of them were, and, and that's too bad. I don't understand your state, honestly, and, and I, need to be, I need to be invited there. Uh, I've been to visit before, but you have the most anti-charter state, uh, from what I know, from the people in the charter movement in the country, um, which is almost like saying that we have an anti-innovation. Uh, um, yeah, because charter schools, to me, are not the solution. Um, uh, they're not a panacea. And l let me be blunt, I spoke to the National uh, Convention for Char American Charter Schools, uh, a couple weeks ago, and I said, look, I said, there are bad charters in, in, in schools in the United States of America that need to be shut down. And I said, this movement will fail if we do not uh, uh, hold ourselves to a higher level of accountability. Uh, and that's one thing people think a charter school is a good school. It's absolutely not. 84% um, of our charter schools in Newark outperform our district. Well, what, what's happening with those charter schools that are not? Uh, why are we tolerating them? I, was I talked to my commissioner of education in the state of New Jersey, and I said, look, you need to shut charter schools down in the state of New Jersey. It's killing the movement. It's killing innovation. Um, and, it's, and it's undermining, uh, it's giving people an argument to be against charters in general. So I don't know much about your state, but I, I hear uh, the strength of the unions uh, uh, and not the kind of unions that, that, that you and I are talking about, Antonio, unions that are, that are in many ways, I believe, putting uh, 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 kids second to, to their to labor issues and concerns. Um, anti-charter state, and the, the, your state has got to take on this issue because education is not a federal issue. I love what, uh, what um, Arnie Duncan is doing. I consider him a friend and, a, and an American hero, but educational problems will always be solved at a local level. And so I encourage you to invite leaders from around America to come to Washington, set up forums, let the dialogue happen. I'll take, um, I'd gladly take uh, uh, arrows uh, in my back or front uh, for, to stand up uh, uh, for children. I just, I just would. And I, I've, I've been invited to other cities to speak out dramatically. I've debated, my, my grandfather's turning over in his grave. I've debated the NAACP because some of the things that they're doing in this country in New York right now 
now. The NAACP, we, we had to fought, we fought, for example, one of the best um, grade schools in the country is the woman sitting uh, two seats away from you, uh, Spark Academy in Newark, New Jersey. I know parents uh, that send their kids there. I know kids that go there, transformative. And so what we've tried to do is the charter schools have a difficult time with facilities. So we co-located her school next year will be in, where, where's it going to be? It's going to be in George Washington Carver, which was, in, the, in, in years past, one of our lowest performing uh, grade schools. So they're co-locating one of our highest performing with what was traditionally, Carver's doing a lot to try to turn around. Wonderful thing, but it was a, we had to fight a battle to do it. Uh, I was savagely attacked, uh, um, criticized, people speaking, it took so much, but now we have one of the best educational programs uh, public programs partnering with another one. And I know there's going to be a rising in that school all, for all children. So nothing, I guess my last point to you is nothing in the education movement is ever going to happen inevitably. As King said, uh, change does not roll on the wheels of inevitability. It'll take heroes like you in your state stepping up and saying, I don't care. I'll take the heat. I'll take the abuse, just like people who ask for women's rights, for workers' rights, for civil rights did. But we have to have to do it because I don't know what the state of education, public education is in, in, in Seattle, but I can imagine that poor kids, brown kids, black kids are really suffering in your state and they need alternatives. You know, by the way, in, in my, uh, I, I believe, uh, I, I said that mayors need to be front and center and uh, in the reform movement, but so do teachers and parents. And I, I believe that the reform movement, in order to work beyond the dynamism of someone like Cory Booker, the next mayor may not be as focused on education uh, as you are, is to have bottom-up reform too. So I, we actually, and it's taken almost five years, but we finally convinced uh, the civil rights community that this was a civil rights issue, that we needed a challenge. I mean, historically, the civil rights in the community, and I come out of the civil rights community, and the unions have been very close. To, you know, they're democratic constituencies, fairly uh, liberal on, on social issues and the like, and they've been allies. Well, we've convinced them that they should be, continue to be allies, but only where those interests merge with the public interest and that we've got to put kids first. And we've laid out and told the story how disproportionately the kids were being impacted by the failure to innovate and change and set high uh, standards are these are poor kids and kids of color. So interestingly enough, I now have all of the civil rights organizations that when I said I sued the school district and the union on the issue of seniority, the ACLU sued the school district. Wow. I used to be the president wow. of that organization, and, and, and I got them and to And so this do is that. why I think your leadership is incredible, honestly, because what's happening in New York is the, the NAACP yeah, is suing yeah. to stop the co-location uh, of kids, and they're doing it this summer. So if, the, if they win their lawsuit, these kids will have, their parents are going to have to scramble to try to find schools to put their kids into because those schools will not have homes and roofs over their heads. So, and all these kids that they're suing to stop to go to these public schools and these public schools, all these kids are black and brown uh, kids uh, from, dis, uh, from uh, many of them from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's, it's, it's unconscionable to me they, what's happened. So what you've pulled off actually sued is incredible. public school choice as well because they don't like that we're forcing uh, competition, the, the, the unions. And we've gotten public interest lawyers, uh, very liberal public interest lawyers, to take on this challenge. So we're actually in, engaged in a uh, left, uh, center left, uh, right left coalition, a civil be. rights business. We, we've gotten the business community, the Wasserman Foundation is one of uh, our supporters. I mean, we've gotten a, a lot of uh, a broad coalition around this idea. And, and virtually all of us, except for a, a small group, are pro-union, but we're challenging a, a broken system and challenging the most powerful defenders of that system. I believe, though, in the end, the only way this will work is it's got to be bottom-up. It's got to be teachers and parents uh, forcing accountability so in these schools. So true. Uh, that's the only way to to have this last beyond the you know the teachers, kind of, parents, and the community as a whole. The, the leadership of people like the two of us. It's got to be transformative and deep uh, and start with parents and teachers. Let's go back to the audience for another question. And uh, can I just say it is wonderful to see so many hands up. Um, why don't we go back here to uh, Anne. Thank you both for your comments and your leadership. And I was curious about um, when we know that the vast majority of low-income kids are in a single-parent family, 95% women, and we think about the incredible support we've seen from a policy and a results 
perspective internationally about investing in women. I'm curious about what you've done or are thinking about doing investing in mothers and kids at the same time because we also know from a U.S. standpoint that the economic level of a mother has a direct correlation to her child's success. In, in my schools, I, we've actually focused a little more on fathers, and I'll tell you why. In many of them, there aren't any. Um, and we, we are working, uh, uh, we don't have a problem with mothers being involved. They're, they're much more involved than the fathers. The problem is we don't have fathers. So we, we've developed uh, two programs to bring in mothers and fathers, uh, muffins for moms uh, and donuts for dads. But with, but, with, but, but with the dads, actually, we've had to broaden uh, you know, who a dad is. So it's your dad if you have one, and many of our kids. There's some schools in Watts uh, where the vast, two-thirds of the kids do not have, uh, I'm sorry, 80% of the kids do not have a dad in the home. So we, we, we have uh, fathers come, uncles come, grandpas come, brothers come, uh, cops come. We I have a program where 77th Street and Southeast, the divisions in my Watts schools, um, you know, firefighters come. Uh, you know, we, we try to bring men in our classrooms because uh, many of these boys particularly don't have a male figure. And then with the moms, we're, 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 we're trying to get, it's not so much, we're trying to get a greater number of them involved in our schools. And every one of these schools have parent centers where we're teaching people English, where we're, uh, we, we, we sit down and tell a parent what your rights are as a parent. Uh, we actually developed in our partnership schools a school report card. We said, hey, if kids get reported, what, uh, should get a report card, why not a school? And parents uh, have to participate in that school report card. By the way, that, uh, we also test every kid for gifted. Uh, and we've had a dramatic increase in the number of gifted kids because before you would get uh, tested for gifted if your parent said, my kid is gifted, I want him to be, he or she to be tested, or if a teacher said it. And unfortunately, in these schools, not enough teachers or parents did that. So we're doing a number of things uh, to include uh, moms, but also dads, because dads, uh, for us, is one of the biggest challenges. There just aren't enough of them. Uh, so those mentorship programs that you talked about, very, very important. You know, whenever I walk into a school, and, you know, I'm a, obviously, uh, since I'm the first for my community in 133 years, particularly with Latino kids, I'm you know, kind of seen as somebody to look up to. I always say, you know, I'm here today uh, because, uh, I, because of the Civil Rights Act that opened up the country to me, and I'm here today because of a public school that gave me a second chance, and that every one of you have an opportunity to reach for the stars. And I tell them I didn't have a dad either, and my dad didn't come to school because I didn't have one. And my mom worked sometimes two jobs and had to take the bus, but she was in my school. And so I tell these parents they have to be involved uh, we, as I said, share their rights and responsibilities. We try to support them. Uh, we, we really try to engage them. And it's a reason why in a lot of our battles recently we've begun to win. I've said, hey, I believe in unions. I think parents ought to have one. Uh, and so we've developed, <laughs> we've, we've developed a parent union in our city. And we've got a very powerful group of parents that have supported Race for the Top, have supported this issue of reforming or eliminating seniority and tenure, uh, teacher effectiveness, uh, parent empowerment. Uh, so, uh, yes, parents, moms, dads, but in our schools, dads are the particular challenge. So my, my answer, quick answer is just help. So what we found in Newark is that we want to be the um, sort of the innovators around new ideas, new, new things. So we created a second, a second ever uh, grandparent support center we found in Delaware uh, that, you know, 10% of our kids, 11% of our kids were being raised by grandparents. Uh, those grandparents were often didn't realize there might be a world of help out there living very isolated lives, now using their fixed incomes to try to now support their kids. So we created a grandparent support center. We partnered a venture philanthropist, social entrepreneur, brought them together. KIPP started as a mom and pop operation that venture philanthropists and others helped them run to scale. Uh, Wendy Kopp and her started a mom and pop organization that, uh, that uh, innovation that uh, uh, people help venture philanthropists and others bring to scale. We started a fatherhood program now that's considered one of the best in the nation for, for kids that have incarcerated dads. These dads come home. We've driven their recidivism rate down to 3%. Um, and how do we do it? 
we part we found a, a program in Philly, brought it to Newark to try to make it better. We brought venture philanthropists together with that program. Now it's doing really well. If you know of a program for mothers, because I agree with you, we see this in developing countries, women will solve the globe's problem, uh, problems, simple as that. And so any program that anybody has an idea of, uh, I'd love to work with you to try to get it a foothold in, in Newark, New Jersey, as I know Antonio as well. We need innovation. This is where we need people with big ideas. Start a pilot program, let's prove it works, and then let's grow it to scale. Can, can you guys, can we take one more question? Is that okay? We're at our limit. You guys can stay for just a few more minutes. Is that possible? Um, why don't we go right here to the gentleman in the blue shirt? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Antonio mentioned the, uh, the uh, UTLA and I've heard of the uh, AFT and the NEA. And I guess my question is uh, to what extent are the decisions that uh, these union organizations are making that are impeding progress, uh, to what extent are they decentralized, centralized, and would it require basically 300 organizations to change their minds, or is there some guidance from the top that could happen? Is, 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 in other words, it, can the national driven from the national organization? Yeah. The state? I think it's a mixture of all of them. Look, I have a lot of respect for Randy Weingarten. I do, uh, but uh, and and I think there are some cities currently. You said yours. You're, you're beginning to negotiate and sit down uh, with your unions. I know that Rochester. Um, I think Detroit. Uh, I know that New York, uh, DC, New and New Haven. Yeah. Um, so it is starting to happen. Uh, ours, uh, you know, I, I know Washington's uh, important, uh, powerful rather. I, I, there's not a more powerful organization than the California Teachers Association. Uh, there's no state affiliate as powerful as them. Your prison guards. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, they're, 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 no, they're not. not. They're, not, they're yeah. not close to as powerful. Really? Yeah, the, the, the CTA is the most powerful. And I work for them, by the way. In addition to the local affiliate, I work for uh, the CTA and the NEA. I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, but uh, the, what, 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 the problem, what, what, what's happened is they've been on the other end as an example. I agree with you. Uh, we should close down all failing schools, whether they're charter or traditional public schools. But they're against uh, charter schools. They're against even our teacher collaboratives, which are, we're saying they're union, but they have to be uh, met. They have to develop plans that are metrics driven. They're against our public school choice program, which is pr the most far reaching effort of its kind in the United States. Now, they've been against uh, multiple measures of evaluation. Uh, they're against, of course, they're, they're going to protect seniority and tenure. Uh, th that will be, a, 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 in th this state, at least for a while, will be a, a, their two biggest uh, areas of defense. Uh, my hope is that, would, that because of the changes that we're forcing on them, that you're going to see a new generation of, of teacher union leaders that are going to say, you don't represent me. You really don't. I want, I want high standards for my profession. I'd like to get paid more uh, if I'm uh, high performing. Uh, I, I want uh, uh, teachers next to me uh, who are held accountable. Uh, I want to innovate and try new things and adopt best practices. So my hope is that they will get in front of uh, the, the, this effort. But as I said, I am absolutely committed. Uh, we're moving ahead. And we're going to move ahead with a broad coalition, including teachers. Uh, but uh, we're not going to continue to put the interest of kids behind the interest of adults. Uh, I always tell union leaders, I'm with you when your interest uh, merges with the public interest. I'm not with you when your interest is just yours alone. That's your job. Uh, my job is protecting, and your job, Corey, I, I know you know very well, is protecting the public interest. So. Uh, you know, I, 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 it is coming from the top, uh, it's coming from uh, the local, and it's coming from the state, all three of them. Uh, but having said that, there's places around the country where it's starting to change. And so let me just, and, and, and first of all, I want to say something good about teachers unions. They are not monolithic. There are a lot of progressive teachers unions that are doing some really incredible partnerships. Um, uh, Antonio is, uh, I think, speaking the, the, a really incredible truth that I need to hear more often about ability to partner, ability to make progressive change. I have very good conversations now with Randy, and she's given me 
uh, great hope and expectation that we will come together and create something in Newark that's really special that will have the country looking. Um, so th please take that. At, I don't want to. I don't want what I'm about to say to, to. And I know we're being streamed live, and there are people back in my city watching this. So um, I, I also we'll, know we're <laughs> being streamed live, yeah, yeah. and that's why I said yeah, what I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so let me end, let me end with this, and and please don't take it in the wrong way. And if you know Rand, uh, Randy and Joe, who are, are going to be my partners, and my destiny is fully wrapped up in theirs, the legacy of our leaderships will be determined. Uh, in our upcoming negotiations, but this is what bothers me uh, about my country. And, and we're about to be Fourth of July. Uh, James Baldwin said, uh, "If you really love your country, then you will exercise your right to criticize it perpetually." Um, and so, uh, th there is something that is, is, is dying in our nation, and it, and it, it is a sense of moral outrage. And uh, everybody in this room uh, knows who Natalie Holloway is, knows who Jean Benet Ramsey is. There's some damn trial, tragic, should capture our attention. It's on the news all right now about the death of another little girl that's captured our attention. But I live in a city, he lives in a city where boys and girls die tragically, savagely, viciously every day. And not one person in this room can name a child that was murdered in LA or Newark uh, at, at all. Um, there's something that has happened where we as a nation uh, have begun to tolerate uh, a level of failure, and we've begun to do what's the worst, belies our, our very national hallmark, e pluribus unum. We begin to think that the problems of some Americans are not a threat to the liberties of all Americans. And more than ever before in human history, we have an interconnected and interdependent destiny. We need that Latino child in Cincinnati right now. Our, our nation is dependent upon its genius. And greater than the Gulf oil spill, and that waste of natural resources that captured all of us it is the greatest natural resource this nation has, is the children in, the, in, in, our, in our schools right now. And we are wasting that natural resource. I've seen up close and personal, sitting inches away, what a child who is destined in all statistics to go to prison. I've seen what a child like that who gets the right opportunities can end up doing when they're an adult. And, and, and this is a great American leader, but there are scientists, there are artists, there are poets, uh, there are biologists who are being wasted right now as other countries are capturing every one of those scientists, poets, uh, artists, and engineers and ensuring that they're going there. And so, uh, you know, I, I return to, and I don't mean this as a, as a slap to teachers unions, I mean this as a slap to all of us, but one of our great uh, uh, leaders, uh, Frederick Douglass, once said, the limits of tyranny are prescribed by the endurance of those who are oppressed. And we as a nation are enduring a level of oppression of our own making that's unconscionable. So we, the teachers union is not to blame for our problems. Uh, politicians are not to blame for our problems. We are, and, 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 and not to quote you to death, but to end with this, King said it so eloquently that, the, that the, what we will have to repent for in our generation, and he's from a different generation, is not the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. I don't care if you're in New Jersey, if you're in Washington State, uh, you cannot let your inability to do everything undermine your determination to do something. We must do something to end the cancer that will kill our country if we do not turn it around. LA and Newark are not moving fast enough to meet the demands of the economy in 50 years from now. This great nation will never lead in the globe if we lag in education. And, and that is a truth that we must begin to accept. And the call of our country is there. Thank you both so much for sharing a sense of what you had. Thank you, guys.